No. When a ma- when a mass point M moves in a conservative field of force described by the potential energy V in the XYZ axis, then if you let it start from a given point A with a given velocity or with a given, for example, a given energy E, you'll be able to get it into another Sorry about that. arbitrarily chosen point B by suitably aiming or by letting it start in a quite definitely chosen direction. Okay. There is in general one definite dynamical orbit which leads from A to B with a given energy. So you got point A, point B. There's one orbit with a given energy to get there. This orbit possesses the property that del of the del times the integral from A to B of two t dt equals zero. Equation mm. one. And is defined by this property, Hamilton's principle in the form given to it by Malpertuis. Oh. Here, capital T means the kinetic energy of the mass point, and the equation means consider the manifold of all orbits leading from A to B and subject to the law of conservation of energy, kinetic energy T plus velocity V equals energy E. Among them, the actual dynamical orbit is distinguished by the fact that for it and for all infinitely adjacent orbits of the manifold, the integral from A to B has the same value up to small quantities of the second order, the words infinitely adjacent being taken to define the first order of smallness. Calling W equals dS over dt, the velocity of the mass point, we have this form of the equation, by means of which equation 1 can be transformed into the integral for del times the integral from A to B of the square root of 2m times parentheses e minus v ds equals 0. This form has the advantage that the variational principle is applied to a purely geometrical integral, which does not contain the time variable. And further, that the condition of constant energy is automatically taken care of. Wait, so he took time out of it. Okay. Hamilton found it useful to compare equation 2 with Fermat's principle, which tells us that in an optically non-homogeneous medium, the actual light rays, or the tracks along which energy is propagated, are determined by the law of minimum time, as it is usually called. I've never heard of that. What the heck is that? Um, let figure one now, now refer to an optical medium of arbitrary non-homogeneity, e.g. the Earth's atmosphere. Then, if you have a searchlight at A, furnishing a well-defined beam, it, it will in general be possible to illuminate an arbitrarily chosen point B by suitably aiming at it with the searchlight. So now he's giving us, like, this is what, we're, what I'm talking about here in real life. You just take it a flashlight, point it from A to B, there we go. There is one definite light path leading from A to B, which obeys and is uniquely identified by this law. Del integral of A to B, ds over U equals zero. Here ds, as before, means the element of the path and use the velocity of light, a function of the coordinates x, y, and z. The two laws containing equations 2 and 3 respectively become identical if we postulate that u equals c over the square root of 2m times e minus v, where c must be independent of x, y, and z, but may depend on e. Thus, we have made a mental picture of an optical medium, optical medium, in which the manifold of possible light rays coincides with the manifold of dynamical orbits of a mass point M moving with given energy E in a field of force V. Whoa. Okay, hold on. Can you scroll down a little bit? The fact that U, the velocity of light, depends not only on the coordinates but also on E, the total energy of the mass point, is of the utmost importance. Let me digest that for just a second before we go to Planck's constant here. Can you scroll up just a tiny bit? Okay. So we got an optical medium, which I'm assuming in this context is talking about the Earth's atmosphere. I'm guessing. No, no. You don't think he's talking about the undulatory ether medium? 100% talking about that. You think he is? Yeah, he's okay. describing a field. Right? His whole okay. thing is to replace... Uh, what's it called? The quantization of the electron as to replace it as a field. So I'm assuming the optical medium would be the electron field. Okay. Okay. So we got a mental picture of an optical medium, 
in which the manifold of possible light rays. So I'd like the total sum of all the potential light rays going through it from A to B coincides with the with the manifold of dynamical orbits of a mass point M. Okay, mass point. I guess a part a particle. Yeah. So move, oh, sorry, go ahead. Moving with given energy E in a field of force V times X, Y, Z. Yeah, V in the in the three axes. So, oh, so you got all the possible light rays. The 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 manifold of all those coincides with all the possible orbits of some particle with moving with energy in a field of force. Okay, and the velocity of light doesn't just depend on the coordinates, but also on how much energy there is. Okay, so he's saying the velocity of light is dependent on E. That's he's not just saying that the velocity of light's constant in that sentence. Mm, it's variable. See here. Let's see. So, yeah. I mean, if E changes, that would yeah. mean that U changes. I mean, he's saying that the fact that this is dependent on that is of the utmost importance. I just wanted to digest like that's kind of wild. Like what what is he setting us up for here? Uh way to describe light as a wave or like you know, a perturbation in that field using the basic or using the principles of Hamilton, right? So just deriving the least amount of or what would it be the the path from A to B to get the the least amount of energy or whatever required to get there. So like that orbital drop off. So he's saying based off of the the principles to derive this, there's an equivalence here if you conceptualize uh, the perturbation in the medium in this in this way. Okay. Can you... Okay, so this fact, the fact that the velocity of light depends not just on the coordinates but on E, enables us to push the analogy a step further by picturing the dependence on the energy E as dispersion, or in other words, as a dependence on frequency. For this purpose, we must attribute to our light rays a definite frequency, little v, depending on E. We will arbitrarily put E equals hv, h being Planck's constant. Hey, I use that equation. Without dwelling much on this assumption, which is very suggestive to modern physics, physicists. This Then this non-homogeneous and dispersed and dispersive medium provides in its rays a picture of all the dynamical orbits of our particle. Okay. Is he talking, when he says particle, are we talking about a photon, bro? Like, yeah. So, uh, let's see the, the non homogeneous dispersion dispersive medium provides the ray, a picture of all the dynamical things. So, so by replacing, Fuck, scrolled way too far up. Sorry about that. So by replacing um, the quantization of it, so he's saying we're going to use E equals HV, but pay no mind to the quantization, meaning the H being proportional to the frequency to provide the quantization. He's saying just say that the energy is proportional to the, vi to, the vi to the vibrational frequency and leave it at that, and we could derive the whole thing from the Hamiltonian. So instead of having to... Um, you know, calculate all the different possible trajectories or whatever, because it's just a, a field, the way that you solve it will just give you the output as if you calculated all of those. Kind of what I'm hmm. getting at. Hmm. Where's my scroll down not working? Hello? Is this as far as we can go here? Oh, click off on the gray area real quick. I did. I can only track, I can, the, bar, I can track only, the bar and see if it'll. I can only go up. Okay, now it's. Now we're good. Sorry about that. Okay. Um. And then it's not a module. Okay. Now we can proceed a stage further. Putting the question. Can yeah. we make? Sorry. So, 
He, the yeah, the Hamiltonian using the non-homogeneous dispersive medium provides the same prediction for the orbital particle A to B. So that's exactly what he's can talking we, about. Can we make a small next page? Oh, sorry. Can we make a small point like light signal? In quotes, he puts point like move exactly like our mass point. Ah, because the mass point was the actual particle. Mm -hmm. But he's saying, now we're going to bring the photon in. Okay. Hitherto, we have only secured the geometrical identity of orbits, quite neglecting the question of time rate. At first sight, this seems impossible since the velocity of the mass point, given this equation, is along the path, i.e. with constant energy, inversely proportional to the light velocity u. C depends on C equation four. C depends on E only. But we must remember that U is, of course, the ordinary phase velocity, whereas a small light signal moves with the so called group velocity, say G, which is given by 1 over G equals ddv V over U. Or in our case, following equation five, by 1 over G dde E over U. Okay. We will try to make G equal to W. The only means we have at our disposal for this purpose is a suitable choice of C, the arbitrary function of E that appeared in equation 4. From 4, 6, and 7, the postulate G equals W becomes this equals that equals that. Hence, E over C minus 1 times the square root of 2M times E minus V is constant with respect to E. Since V contains the coordinates and C must be a function of E only, this relation can obviously be secured in a general way only by making the first factor vanish. Hence, E over C minus 1 equals 0, or C equals E, which gives equation 4 the special form U equals E over square root of 2M times E minus V. He's doing some good old manipulations, okay? This assumption about phase velocity is the only one which will secure absolute coincidence between the dynamical laws of motion of the mass point and the optical laws of motion of light signals in our imagined light propagation. Hmm. Hmm. It is worthwhile mentioning that according to equation 8, U equals energy over momentum, equation 8 prime. There's still one arbitrariness in the definition of U, vis-a-vis -vis E may obviously be changed by an arbitrary additive constant if the same constant is added to V. This arbitrariness cannot be overcome in the non-relativistic treatment, and we are not going to deal with the relativistic one in the present lectures. Okay. <clears throat> now, the fundamental idea of wave mechanics is the following. The phenomenon of which we believed we had given an adequate description in the old mechanics by describing the motion of a mass point by giving its coordinates x, y, z as functions of the time variable t is to be described correctly according to the new ideas by describing a definite wave motion which which takes place among waves of the type considered or of the definitive of the definite frequency and velocity and hence of the definite wavelength which we ascribe to what we called light in the preceding the mathematical description of a wave motion will be furnished not by a limited number of functions of the one variable t but by a continuous manifold, so to speak, of such functions, vis-a-vis -vis by a function or possibly by several functions of x, y, z, and time. These functions will be subject to a partial differential equation vis-a-vis -vis to some sort of wave equation. The statement that what really happens is correctly described by describing a wave motion does not necessarily mean exactly the same thing as what really exists as the wave motion. Hmm. The statement that what really happens is correctly described by describing wave motion does not necessarily mean exactly the same thing as saying what really exists is the wave motion. Interesting. So he's just drawing a distinction between what's happening since what's being correctly described by wave motion as to what really exists as being the wave motion. Interesting. We shall see later on that in generalizing to an arbitrary mechanical system, we are led to describe what really happens in such a system by a wave motion in the generalized space of its coordinates. U space. Whatever. What? 
generalized space of its coordinates? I mean, generalized space. Uh, so if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's just some place for the system, just some coordinate. Okay. Though the latter has quite a definite physical meaning, it cannot be very well be said to exist. Hence, a wave motion in this space cannot be said to exist in the ordinary sense of the word either. Ah, he's saying it's a mathematical construct, so I can't say that it's actually physically real and it exists. I'm just describing. Okay. It is merely an adequate mathematical description of what happens. It may be that also in the case of one single mass point with which we are now dealing, the wave motion must not be taken to exist in too literal a sense. Although the configuration space happens to coincide with ordinary space in this particularly simple case. All right, that was point one. Who is he okay. lecturing to, bro? Uh, University of it's, it was in like the second page or something. That's cool because his title for a lecture is like an equivalent to a thesis project for like ten year <laughs> PhD study, and he's like, "Yeah, this was a Tuesday afternoon in an hour." Jane, you want to cover number two? Me? Yeah. Mm. I got you. I'll read for a bit. Ordinary mechanics, only an approximation which no longer holds, holds for various small systems. In replacing the ordinary mechanical description by a wave mechanical description, our object is to obtain a theory which comprises of both ordinary mechanical phenomenon in which quantum conditions play no appreciable part, and then on, on the other hand, typical quantum phenomenon. The, the hope of reaching this object resides in the following analogy. Hamilton's picture or Hamilton's wave picture worked out in the, in the way discussed above contains something that corresponds to ordinary mechanics. V's the rays correspond to the mechanical paths and signals move like mass points. But the description of the wave motion in terms of the ray is merely an approximation called geometrical optics in the case of light rays. And only holds true if the structure of the wave phenomenon that ha that we happen to be dealing with is coarse compared to the wave compared with the wavelength, and and as long as we are only interested in its coarse structure, the detail of a fine structure wave phenomenon can never be revealed by the treatment in terms of a ray, aka geometrical optics, and there will always exist the wave phenomenon, which altogether so minute that the ray way that the rave method way, mm, ray method is of no use to furnished uh, and furnishes no information whatsoever. Hence replacing ordinary mechanics by wave mechanics. We may hope in one hand to retain ordinary mechanics as an approximation, which is valid for the coarse micro mechanical phenomenon. And on the other hand, we get the explanation of those minute micro mechanical processes or uh, phenomenon. Uh, let's see motion of electrons with the, or in atoms with, uh, about which ordinary mechanical processes was quite unable to give any information. At least it was unable to do so without making artificial accessory assumptions, which really formed much more, imp which, <laughs> which formed a much more important part of the theory itself rather than the me uh, mechanical treatment itself. Very cool. Let's see. This step, which leads away from ordinary mechanics to the wave mechanics, is advanced similar to so similar in kind to Hudgens' light or theory of light, which replaced Newton's theory. We might form a symbolic portion. Ordinary mechanics uh, with a ratio to wave mechanics equals geometric optics equals undulatory optics. Nice. Typical quantum or typical quantum phenomenon are analogous to typical wave phenomenon like diffraction and interference. For the conception of this analogy, it is considerable. It is of a considerable importance that the failure of ordinary mechanics does occur in dealing with tiny, with, in dealing with very tiny systems. We can immediately control the order of magnitude at which the complete failure is to be expected, and we find that the we find that it is the exactly right one. The wavelength, say lambda of our waves, is seen in equation five and eight. And we have equation nine here, which gives the wavelength for the old lambda i.e. Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the mass point. Now, take for the sake of simplicity a circular orbit of, of the hydrogen model of a radius A, not necessarily a quote-unquote quantized one. Then we have the ordinary mechanics, or then we have by ordinary mechanics without applying quantum rules, 
some equation that I'm not going to read, even though it's a pretty simple one. I'm already past it. Where n is a is any real positive number for Bohr's quantized circles would be one, two, or three. The occurrence of h in the latter equation is for the moment only convenient is the only convenient way of expressing the order of magnitude. Combining the last two equations, we get lambda over a equals two pi over n. I'll go ahead and read that one for free. In an order, and now in now in order that we may that uh, now in order that we may be justified in application of ordinary mechanics, it is necessary that the dimensions of the path calculated in this way should turn out to be a large should turn out to be large compared to the wavelength. This is seen to be the case as the as long as the quantum number quote unquote n is larger is large compared to unity. As n becomes smaller and smaller, the ratio of lambda to a becomes less and less favorable. Complete failure of the ordinary of ordinary mechanics is expected precisely in the region where we meet with it. V's where n is the order of unity and as it would be as it would be for the orbits of a normal size of an atom of 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. Bohr uh, section 3 Bohr stationary ether levels derived as frequency or proper vibrations of waves. Let us now consider the wave mechanical treatment of a case which which is inaccessible to ordinary mechanics. Say, say to fix our idea, the wave mechanical treatment of ordinary mechanics is called motion of the electron in the hydrogen atom. In what way are we to attack this problem? Well, in a very much way we would attack a, a problem of finding the possible movements or, or vibrations of, a, of an elastic body. Only in the latter case, the problem is complicated by the existence of two types of waves, longitudinal and transverse. To avoid this complication, let us reconsider an elastic fluid contained in a given enclosure. For the pressure P, we should have the wave, wave equation given by equation 10, where U is the constant velocity of propagation of the longitudinal waves. The only possible wave, uh, wait, it says, the, the, only pos the only wave possible in this case of a fluid case of a fluid, the longitudinal, that's that the, is that the peaks and valleys one, or is that the, uh, longitudinal is along the direction of motion and transverse is, is across like a tra like, uh, perpendicular across the direction of motion. Okay. Yeah. Like running across the street that you're going, that you're driving down. Gotcha. All right. We should try to find. Are we? So we should try to find the most general solution for the for this partial differential equation that satisfies certain boundary conditions at the surface of the vessel. The standard way of trying to uh, the uh, the standard way of solving this is to try this equation, which gives for psi the equation ten prime, uh, where psi is subject to the same boundary conditions as p. We then meet the we then meet. We then meet with the well-known fact that the regular solution psi satisfying the equation in all boundary conditions cannot be met for all values of the coefficient of psi, i.e. all frequencies nu, but only for an in infinite set of discrete frequencies, nu sub 1, nu sub 2, nu sub 3, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to nu sub k, uh, which, are call, which are called for the characteristics or proper frequencies against the frequencies in of the <laughs> of the problem or or the body, eigen 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 frequency. <laughs> yeah, dude, Volkswagen or whatever. So, <laughs> call psi k the solution. Ordinary unique uh, apart from the multiplying constant that belongs to v or new sub k. Then, since the equation and the boundary conditions are homogeneous, equation eleven will, with arbitrary constants. K C sub K and theta sub K will be more general, will be a more general solution. And we will indeed be the, and will indeed be the general solution. If the set of quantities psi K and V nu K is complete for physical applications, we shall of course use the real part of the expression of equation 11. You don't want to use that fake part. You want that real stuff. All right. Let's see here. In the case of the waves, which is which are to replace, uh, in the case of the waves, which are to replace our thought of motion of the electron, there, yeah, see, there, there must also be some quantity p subject to the wave equation, like equation ten. 
Though we cannot yet tell the physical meaning of P, let us put this equation aside for the moment. In equation 10, we shall put, we shall have it put, we shall have to put uh, C above uh, equation eight. This is not a constant. It depends on one, on, on E is essentially the, on the frequency, new equals E divided by Planck's constant. On the, on the coordinates X, Y, Z, which are contained in the potential energy V. These are two, these are two complications. Uh, these are two complications as compared with a simple case of a vibrating fluid, fluid body considered above. Neither of them is serious by the first, the dependence of E, we, we are restricted in that we can apply the wave equation only to the function of P whose dependence on time is given by equation 12. Whence, We need not mind that since the since it is precisely the same assumption as in, as sats I don't know uh, as would be made in any case of the standard method solution Sub substituting from equation twelve and equation eight and ten with replacing the letter p by psi to remind us now just before we are investigating as a function of the coordinates only we obtain equation thirteen we now see that the second complication the dependency of u and v or u on i Fuck. U on V, i.e. on the coordinates, merely results in a somewhat more interesting form of equation 13 as compared to equation 10 prime. The quantity of multiplying psi being no longer a constant, but depending on the coordinates, this was really to be expected since the equation was to embody the mechanical problem. Uh, this, was, this was really to be expected since an equation that is to embody the mechanical problem cannot very well help containing the potential energy of the problem. The simplification of the problem, quote, mechanical waves, or quote, mechanical, end quote, waves as compared to the fluid problem consist in the absence of the boundary conditions. I thought the latter simplification fatal when I first attacked these equations or questions. Being insufficiently versed in, the, in mathematics, I could not imagine how, how proper vibration frequencies appear without boundary conditions. Later, I recognized that a more complicated form of coefficients, i.e. the appearance of V, takes charge, so to speak, of what is, ordinary, of ordin what is ordinarily brought about by uh, boundary conditions, namely the section of, def of the definite values of E. I cannot enter into this rather lengthy mathematical discussion here, nor, nor into the detail of the process of finding the solutions through the method that is practically the same as the ordinary vibrational problems, namely introducing an appropriate set of coordinates, e.g. spherical or elliptical according to the form, uh, the function of V, and putting psi equal to a product of the function, each of which contains a, a one coordinate only. Shoot. I will set the stage of the result straightforwardly for the case of the hydrogen atom. Here we have put equation 14, R being the distance from the nucleus, then in, it is found that not for all, but for only the following values of E, is it possible to find the regular value, the, or the regular one value of the finite solution psi, and given by equation 14 prime, section B. Uh, let's see, the constant is the same as equation 14 and is non relevant, is, and is in non relativistic wave mechanics. These are my favorite type of wave mechanics. Go ahead and highlight that. Meaning, uh, meaningless except, let's see, the constant's in the same as equation 14 and is meaningless except that we cannot very well get the get, give the value which is usually adopted for the sake of simplicity, V is zero, for, for then all the values A would become negative and a negative frequency, if it means anything at all, means the same as the positive frequency of the same absolute value. Ah. Then it would be very mysterious why the positive frequency should be allowed, but only get a discrete set of negative ones. But a question of this constant is of no importance here. You should see that our differential equation automatically selects as allowed uh, E values A. The, uh, let's see, the energy levels of the elliptical orbits quantized by quantized according to Bohr's theory and B, all energy, all energy levels belonging to hyperbolic orbits. This is very remarkable. It shows that whatever waves may mean physically, their, their theory furnishes a method of quantization which is absolutely free from arbitrary postulates 
That is, or quantity must be an integer. That this or that quantity must be an integer. Oh, thank you. Just to give an idea of how the integers occur here, if e.g. phi is an azimuth angle, then the wave amplitude turns out to contain a factor of the cosine of m phi, m being an arbitrary constant, then m must necessarily be the chosen integral since otherwise the wave function would not be a single valued. Would not be single valued. You will be interested in the form of the wave function psi, which belongs to the E values mentioned above and, and will inquire whether any observable facts can be obtained by them. This is the case, but matter, but the matter is rather intricate. Oh, that was lecture day one. Good job. Cursory. Easy. It's, it's too... Too bad second lecture. Yeah, Yo, we'll be done with this in 20 minutes. We're, th <laughs> we're 30 minutes in to the T. But no, this is dope, though. I like it. Uh, does Shane, somebody, just yep. somebody with mouth, use it? Mm -hmm. Actually, quick question. Would you be opposed to downloading this PDF and hosting it yourself and scrolling so I can do something on the side while you're doing that? Mm, yep, that would be easier. Thank you. Let me send you the PDF now. I'm actually mid correcting someone else's meme and we can share, <laughs> we, can sh we can share this first. I think this is a really good job. Awesome. Awesome. Let's take a gandy. I can't wait till we get to point number five here in just a second. Pizio, have you, have you pre-read? Are you pre-Duncan? No, I'm just looking at the. Oh, the I'm just excited. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. The physical sure. meaning of the wave function is point five. Mm. Yeah, what's homie saying the physical meaning is, you know what I'm saying? Mm, let's see, scientist and man who saw a YouTube video. Yes, you're all wrong. <laughs> that is funny. Then, Social media conformists in, in, in people, men who read... Men who read 730 PDS and formed a zone of... <laughs> 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 Respect. <laughs> All right, where's the beat? Yeah. <laughs> All right, it's uh, scroll up to 227 past the hour. I just uh, arrogantly repost my own reply because people will miss it otherwise, and I want to share it with them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before I flooded it with all my sources Dude, that I'm going to link. He was like, what are you guys doing tonight? How late is everyone going to be oh, up? Yeah, how does many PDFs can I bring Does anyone want to read a four-part Schrodinger lecture? We're all For like, nobody? We're all For like, no, like, not live? We're all like, yeah, I guess. Well, I'm recording it, so it'll oh, at least... Okay. It, I'm not going to I'm not gonna let this go to waste. That's smart. Yeah. That's smart. How many... Uh, what page were you on, dude? Ooh, good I question. I didn't we had to read all four parts of it. It's just, you know... Whoa, that's cowardice talk. We're definitely reading all four. Um, so we're on second lecture, rough descriptions of the wave systems, uh, page 14. Yeah, PZO. You think it's slow, but it's, it's so dense. I'm not going to listen wow, to that, you... that cowardice, dude. Oh, whoa, we don't have to read it all. <laughs> yeah, right, dog. Are you spite reading and spite learning and improving yourself out of spite? Yes. <laughs> Great. Well, <It's> the best <laughs> that's exactly what's happening, Ross. Oh, I was go through all 50 something pages. It's like, well, I mean. Well, I'm so determined that you suck that I'm going to make all the improvements to myself, not for me, to fuck with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> so you want to hit good old F11 for us? Oh, okay. Never mind. What? Oh, oh God! Keyboard, ah. I with my left hand, or my oh. mouse has macros. Oh, bro. please, for, for the love of F11. God, hit F eleven, <laughs> <laughs> please. Oh, thank you. <sighs> my anxiety was go. Whew. Thanks, PZO. <laughs> I saw all those tabs and. Whew. Oh okay. right, yes. So page fourteen, my dude. Oh, you found it. You're on it. Nope. nope. Wait. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Go ahead. Yeah, I got half a height. Hold on. Same. Wait, if I start reading now, I'll definitely cough in a minute. Let's see. I go for it. Fuck it. 
the rough description of the wave system and the hydrogen atom, degeneracy, perturbation. You're like that right there, that title is not like a lecture hall uh, class thing. It's like, this is my primary thesis after 12 years of dedicated research and it's going to be my doctorate. <laughs> the chief property of the amplitude function is that those which belong to the discrete set of values E sub n, elliptical or elliptic orbits, fall off very rapidly with the distance from the nucleus. It's like an exponential E to the constant R. Mm. E to the constant, what, constant? So what the hell is that, dude? It's it's some number, some constant. E Con to the negative something R, like Con 2R, 4R, 10R. Constant R. dot R. What the hell notation is that? It's const, short for constant. Mm -hmm. That part I got. What's with the... Oh, it's just abbreviating. It's a period. It's not part of it. Okay. Which practically restricts them to a region of precisely the same order of magnitude as the corresponding Bohr orbit. The others, which belong to hyperbolic levels, fall off much less rapidly. This only like R to the negative one. The detailed behavior of the elliptic functions within the said region cannot very well be described in a unique way for the following reason. To one value, E sub n, there belongs in general not only one, but precisely n squared independent solutions of the wave equation. From the mathematical point of view, this is an exception due to the particular form of the potential energy V, especially in its spherical symmetry. This multiplicity of solutions belonging to one proper value corresponds to the well-known multiplicity of orbits belonging to the same energy level in Bohr's theory. It is there called degeneracy, and we will keep this expression in wave mechanics also. Now, since the equation is linear and homogene homogeneous, any linear aggregate with quite arbitrary coefficients will also be a solution to the a solution belonging to the same proper value. It is well known that in such a case, no set of solutions is in any way distinguished from any other set derived from the first by forming a set of independent linear aggregates equal in number to the first set. By this process of forming linear aggregates, we can reach solutions which exhibit a very different behavior. To give an example from a set of solutions whose node services are concentric spheres, coaxial cones, planes passing through the cone axis, you can form other solutions in which the concentric spheres and coaxial cones are replaced by two sets of conformal paraboloids. This is only the simplest of cases. In general, taking arbitrary coefficients, the system of node services will be much more complicated. Uh, this multiplicity of solutions, or as often said, the proper values, which, by the way, is well known from ordinary vibration problems, is one of the utmost important, one of the utmost importance in the case of the atom. There is no multiplicity, and you fit for the lowest frequency n equals one. Then a slight alteration of the potential energy V corresponding e.g. to the application of a weak external electric field will cause nothing but a slight displacement of the proper value and a slight alteration of the proper solution. Just as a small piece of metal attached to a tuning fork would slightly alter its pitch and its form of vibration, but a multiple, say a fold proper value shows its actual multiplicity in this case in that it splits up into a slightly different proper values into a slightly different proper values. Every one of them has now, or alpha, whatever, <laughs> has now a quite definite proper function, which differs very little from a quite definite linear aggregate of the proper functions that belong to the multiple value. This splitting up may theoretically be caused for the very slightest disturbance, yet may differ widely for two disturbances that are different in character. For instance, a, homoge a homogeneous electric field produces the parabolic node surfaces mentioned before, whereas a magnetic field produces the spheres and cones. It need hardly be said that this splitting up corresponds in the two cases just mentioned to the splitting up of the hydrogen lines in the Zeeman and the Stark effects. The displacement of the lines is quantitatively described by the new theory, just as it was by the older one. But something more is described, which was inaccessible to the older theory, namely the state of polarization of the lines, their intensities, and in particular, the absence of a lot of lines which we should all expect to appear if we took into account all the possible differences of the split energy levels. We shall see this presently. The physical meaning of the wave function, explanation of the selection rules and of the rules for the polarization of spectral lines. Is this a whole new lecture? No, it's just a section. The high importance of the perturbation effects consists in the fact that as soon as the degeneracy is removed, we have to deal with uniquely defined proper functions. Uh, we use something epsilon sub k, <laughs> some Greek thing sub k, and now more easily test any hypothesis about the physical meaning of a quantity called that thing again. <laughs> so somebody, uh, uh, isn't that a uh, devil's psi? pitchfork? Psi. Dude, it could be anything. I Can I just sigh? 
I'm going to call yeah. it Psy. Called Psy. Let us. Yeah. Physical meaning of the quantity called Psy. Let us call E sub K equals H V sub K and Psi sub K of X, Y, Z. The proper values, proper frequencies, and proper functions of a problem whose potential energy V we suppose sufficiently unsymmetrical to do away with all degeneracy. Then Psi equals the sum of, well, let's see. Dude, I forget all that notation. C sub K, Psi sub K, C squared times pi times I times V sub K, T to the T plus theta sub K all over K or something? Or I missed a K? With arbitrary constants would describe the most general vibration of the system. In order to avoid ambiguity, since every psi sub k in itself is only defined apart from arbitrary multiplying constant, we shall subject the psi sub k's to the normalization condition of this ridiculous triple integral? What is that? It's, that, a, it's an a, integral in the x, y, and z axes. Mm. Oh, thank you. I was, I was wondering what they, what they were doing with those. You're like, we did this three times, and I want you to know, and here's a fancy symbol that only applies here that I'll use just for this to see or probably some other reason. <laughs> Dude. Perhaps this is a, the place to mention a very important property which the size sub case possess automatically. They are orthogonal to each other. Oh. And they form a complete orthogonal set. A function which is orthogonal to them all must necessarily vanish. These properties are important for the development of an arbitrary function in a series in terms of the size of k's, but we shall not enter upon that here as we do not need it for the moment. Now return to the general vibration function. We put the question, is it possible to ascribe a definite physical meaning to the quantity psi in such a way that the emission of light with frequencies vkk prime equals v sub k minus v sub k prime becomes intelligible? Yes, it is, but strange to say, only if we make use of the complex psi function as it stands, instead of its real part, as we are accustomed to do in ordinary vibration problems. Here, we have not taken into account the continuous spectrum corresponding to the hyperbolic orbits. Huh. We may either suppose those these modes of vibration to be absent, or we may take the summation to include, as a limiting case, the integral, which would have to be added in order to take proper account of the continuous region of proper values. At all events, I wish to avoid encumbering the, form the formulae more than necessary. The hypothesis which we have to admit is very simple, namely that the square of the absolute value of psi is proportional to an electric density, which causes emissions of light according to the laws of ordinary electrodynamics. Hence, the square of the absolute value of psi is formed by multiplying psi by the conjugate complex quantity, which we will call psi with whatever that line above it is. <laughs> the glance at an expression shows that the terms which compose Double psi line thing. <laughs> I'm just gonna start making shit up. <laughs> no, it's, the the top line is the uh, the average of them or whatever, right? So uh, the conjugate complex quantity, which we'll call psi thing. Dude, I, I know it. I know it, but I don't remember it. I don't even know the difference, and I don't know how to pronounce it, and I'm just gonna ignore it for now. <laughs> which contain time in the form of a cosine factor of the desired frequency, V sub K minus V sub K Don't read it. You don't have to read it. Just say equation 18, bro. It's, 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 it's We're not in it. Oh, you mean like, I'm not going to read that big one. I Like yeah. the V K by minus V K prime, though? That seems... Seems like you can get that one in there. Yeah, it seems like that one would be useful. The rest of it I would immediately skip because it starts with the shit I can't pronounce. So it's like, but... More precisely, let us put for the charge density... P, where E means the absolute elect electronic charge, integrating this over the whole space and making use of equations we find for the total charge. Whoa. Dude, what is E again? I was making that up too, just for my own. Uh, it's the natural number E. Isn't that like a sum or something? No, e, e is the natural number. It's like. That's E sub something, I thought, like log, not big E, like summation E. Hold on. No, it's not a sum. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a constant. No, he's talking about sigma, bro. Not not the E. Not the letter oh. E. He's talking about that sigma. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Little, yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> yeah, that's Capital the, E. It's the summation of K. <laughs> okay, that's what not I bad. thought. Yeah, a little E sub other stuff I'm, I'm fine with. But yeah, summation of K. Because if, if I say it wrong three times, I'll quit it to memory and I'll forever be wrong about it, right? So... <laughs>
Happens to me all the time. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, gone. I'm sorry, I'll never get that right. My bad. <laughs> in order to... Well, we're sure that we ha shall have to postulate in order to make the total charge equal to the electronic charge, which we feel inclined to do. It was said before that psi, and hence P, is practically confined to a very small region of a few angstrom units, since the wavelengths of the light radiation V sub K minus V sub K prime are very large compared with this region. It is well known that the radiation of the fluctuating density P will be very nearly the same as that of an electric dipole whose electric movement has the Z component. Yo. And then... Good. Oh. And similarly formed X and Y components. Calculating M sub Z from that equation, we find after an easy reduction, yada, 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 here, alpha K sub K sub prime is an abbreviation for the following constant. That's a constant? Then <laughs> means a sum over all the pairs K and K sub prime. Hence, the squares of these integrals and the corresponding integrals relating to the x-y directions determine the intensity of emitted light of frequency. Uh, forget what the lines mean. The intensity is not determined by them alone. The amplitude constant C sub k also come into play, of course, but this is quite satisfactory. <clears throat> For the integrals alpha k sub and k sub prime are determined by the nature of the system. Oh, the, line, the, the lines are absolute value. <sighs> right. I knew that was an easy one. I was like, hmm. For the integrals, A, K, and K sub prime are determined by the nature of the system by its proper functions, regardless of its state. A sub K and K sub prime is the amplitude of the corresponding dipole, which would be produced by the proper vibrations psi K and psi K prime, if only these two were excited and with equal strength, uh, which would equal C sub K prime equals one over the square root of two. Huh. The first sum is of no interest to our investigation of the emitted radiation, since it means a component of electric moment that is constant in time. The correctness of our psi, psi hypothesis has been checked by calculating the alpha k in case sub, uh, k sub k prime in those cases where the psi sub k's are sufficiently well defined, namely in the case of the Zeeman and the Stark effects. The so-called rules of selection and polarization and the intensity distribution on these patterns are described by the alpha k k sub primes in the following obvious way, and the description is in complete agreement with the experiment. The absence of a line which might be expected to occur, selection rule, is described by the vanishing of the corresponding alpha k and k sub prime and of the two other constants relating to the x and y directions. The linear polarization of a line in definite direction is described by the fact that only the constants alpha K, K sub prime relating to this direction differs from zero, whereas the two other constants vanish. Ah, I like vanishing constants and equations being derived from uh, kinematic equivalencies or whatever. In a similar way, the circular polarization, say, in the XY plane is indicated by the vanishing of the Z constant, the equality of the X and Y constants, and a phase difference of pi over two between the corresponding cosine functions in, a, in that equation. Finally, the intensity relations between the non-vanishing components in the Stark and the Thiemann patterns of hydrogen are correctly indicated by the relations between the squares of the alpha k k sub prime in question, which is satisfactory since the assumption of the c, k, c sub k will be equal for the fine structure components of one level is very suggestive, notwithstanding our lack of knowledge of the c sub k's in other respects. Of course, it is impossible to set forth in this lecture any of the calculations that led to the results just given. They would fill pages and pages and are not at all difficult, but very tedious. Yeah, I don't doubt it, bro. In spite of their tediousness, it is rather fascinating to see all the well-known but not understood rules and hypothetical quotations come out one after another as a result of a very familiar elementary and absolutely cogent analysis, like for the fact that whatever that equation is vanishes unless n equals m, once the hypothesis about psi has been made, no accessory hypothesis is needed or is possible. None could help us if the rules did not come out correctly, but fortunately they do. I think I have to draw attention to another fact, which was only briefly mentioned at the beginning, namely that the very fundamental frequency rule of Bohr in that equation may also be said to be explained by the psi hypothesis. <sighs> Something exists in the atom which actually vibrates which with the observed frequency. A certain part of the electric density distribution, or if you prefer, of psi, 
this might lead us to suspect. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, nope. Oh, I think oh, I just oh, I did that. Like I was like, ah, okay, I'm with you. This Something might... exists in the atom which actually vibrates. Frequency. The... So like, oh, cesium oscillation and time dilation is it down to an oscillating frequency or something? Maybe. <laughs> Similarly. Exactly what it is. That's how they calibrated it in the first place. Whoa! <laughs> no way. So that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. This might lead us to suspect that only the square of its absolute value and not the psi function itself has a real meaning. And this suspicion, again, might arouse the desire to replace the wave equation by an equation which describes the behavior of psi directly. To remove this desire, I will remind you of a case in which a similar desire might occur for exactly similar reasons, yet all of you will confess that it would be fatal to pursue it. Yeah, dude, Max he's, he's body bagging Max Born's uh, squaring the wave equation right now. <laughs> Pages and pages of tedious math. I can create means that nothing. It means nothing. I can anyone can do that about anything. <laughs> Max, <Yeah. laughs> mathematical fiction. Maxwell's equations describe the behavior of the electromagnetic vectors, but these are not really accessible to observation. The only things that are observable are the ponderomotor forces, or if you please, the energy, since the forces are caused by virtual energy differences. But all these quantities, energy, Maxwellian stresses, are quadratic functions of the field vectors. Therefore, we might desire to replace Maxwell's equations by others that determine the observable quadratic functions of the field vectors directly. But everyone will agree that this would, at all events, mean an immense complication and that it would not really be possible to do without Maxwell's equations. Is that number six? Okay, sweet. Hold on one second. Had to sneeze. Um. So can you scroll up for just a second? Yeah, so no no sorry, scroll up. Yeah, yeah. So basically this quantization of point particles, right? He's like he's got this Bohr model and their atom has got these shells with n numbers and all the like this perfect planetary orbit garbage in its early conception it's been changed since then but and he's like yeah man well you know you can do that he's like or you could just leave this as a fully intact wave equation because it's going to capture like all these different things he was going through intensity and all these other other things that the full equation captured and he's, but then he comes to the end and he's like, you know, we actually physically see the physical meaning of this is there is something that exists physically in an atom that actually is moving, vibrating with the observed frequency vis-a-vis -vis a certain part of the electric density distribution. Now, what is the electric density distribution of an atom? It would be the amount or of... Electron layers or whatever? <laughs> well, it, would be, it, it would be like the amount of charge distributed over like the amount of mass in the atom, right? Then, so it needs like a certain part of that. So within the, you know, material of this atom, there's charge. And within a certain part of that charge, we see a vibration slash oscillation at a particular frequency. Yeah, they don't. They they lie well, right? Well, dude, like, and this when we we're talking about like the four fundamental forces a couple of weeks ago. After having read that one dude's paper or or good chunks of it, I was like, oh yeah, dude, it kind of makes sense because you got the electrostatic, you got the electromagnetic force, which is you know electromagnetism. You got gravity, which is you know gravity, but then you still have the strong force and the weak force, and the weak force was said to be the um, this vibration and the strong force was said to be like the uh, rotation of the of like <laughs> the little vortice here or whatever. So I'm I'm just thinking like, or that's what I said after reading his stuff, saying uh, reading some of his stuff. Like it, 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 it's 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 just odd that these atoms have these. You, you do the three vector 3D, you know, 
uh, analyses of, of all their energy and everything. It's like, oh, dude, well, we found there's a proportionality between the speed of light and the energy, but all this is based on frequency. And then this frequency actually like corresponds to a, an actual physical vibration within a part of the atom. It's like, huh. So you're saying that the amount of energy within the atom corresponds to the rate at which it's vibrating and oscillating. Huh. Over <clears throat> over a one second period of time. Into its relative density based on charge levels and you know, maybe. Because if it's oscillation, you like you got feel, fields that are like, all right, this is a probability cloud where we think it is that it has to be before it goes to the next probable area based on a probability cloud. Yeah, what's oscillating though? Are you saying that uh, an electron which doesn't so have a physical position? That David like... David Lapont would say, you know, not everything is spheres. It's not all circles. Everything's toroidal, right? So it's not a bar magnet. It's a double bowl toroidal double torus <laughs> that would act exactly the same field inflection direction wise for compass readings, etc. But would in fact be the three D representation of exactly that the, the toroid. He thinks everything's toroidal, so. He would say that the atom would be like a, a misrepresentation of that oscillating toroidal sort of field, right? If everything's based on these forces, then these forces manifest in the same pattern all the time, I guess. Well, vor I mean, I mean, vortices are toroidal. I mean, they're like little, they're like little. Yeah. Rainbow, when you say vortices, can you draw me a picture? Because your other thing for the the way the stars work was called something like that, and I was like, that's retarded. <laughs> and then I saw it, and I was like, whoa, that's what I have in my head. <laughs> Dude, that was awesome. We need to have a star <laughs> night again. Uh, like a smoke ring, except, except uh, as a smoke ring spins inwards or whatever or outwards, you can imagine like it dragging like the air within outwards or inwards as well. So, so make it like a make it like a bunt like a like a cake like a funnel cake. The dude, if everything is held together by electrostatic forces, then determining a gradient of density based on the charge layer would only create the gradient that fuck, I lost it. <laughs> I looked around and I was like, I saw a pretty color. Fuck. No, he's saying that the vibration is observed within a certain part right. of the electric density. Right, right. So they like like they like great. They're like, hey, this thing. Uh, has this observable phenomenon that we're going to call a frequency or an oscillation or a rate. And what I'm going to say it is, is going to be astronomically retarded, unfounded, unscientific, unsupported, and almost retarded. But you're going to believe it. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> it's like, uh, so we take an observation and we lie through our teeth. Like the circumference. We look at the, the sun and we like, okay, see those sun rays? They're actually completely opposite of that, that no one's ever seen, that we've never measured. But we know that's the case because that's how we determined our circumference of the Earth that we're on. And you're like, no, that's retarded too, though. <laughs> Wait a second. Well, I mean, he, this last paragraph, he, I've been saying this for a while. He says, he says, Maxwell's equations describe the behavior of the electromagnetic vectors, but these are not really accessible to observation. The only things that are observable are the energy, since the forces are caused by virtual energy differences. Dude, like, that's all they're able to do at the atomic scale is energy measurements. Yep. They're yeah. trying to quantize everything in the unit, the smallest they could possibly measure. And all they've done is identify that at the smallest scale, macro matches the micro, and it's toroidals all the way down, bros. <laughs> I do think that there is something to the oscillatory vibrational nature of the atomic scale, though, because the uh, nature of a vortex has both oscillation and like rotation or whatever. Uh-huh. A moving 3D pulsating toroidal field wouldn't be a, you know, paper slice looking down as we represent it. It would be moving, like, literally a 3D. You know those uh, cymatic patternizations where they put, like, sand or dust on a speaker and then they play it, and it's like, oh, it's pretty. It makes, like, a star and a yeah. snowflake, and you're like, that's cool, but that's, like, a, a conic slice of that actual uh, radicule they're trying to project, and if you think about it, in 3D space, that's going in every direction all the way, and that snowflake is a circular, spherical sort of, yeah, you know, double, the uh, bowl maggot, double toroidal shape, really. 
Well, like the the field lines of the tor, like if you use like the toroid model of the Earth or whatever, the field lines are constantly like whirling up and out and down and around and back up again, right? That's the like rotational or whatever velocity. But then the oscillatory is just like those field lines as as well as going out and a, and around and back and down and up and through and top again as they go in and out and around. They're also like vibrating. So there are two different types of motions there. There's like the motion of like the rotation or like the toroidal, you know, flow, so to speak. But there's also like those field lines that are flowing, vibrating right. simultaneously. And he's saying that this vibrational, in that model, if what he's saying is correct, what it would correspond to would be the vibrational part. That's what he's saying the frequency is. Right. Right. So it's an observable, repeatable, actual thing, right? A metric or a observation or whatever so that's you're saying that the frequency controls what aspect of atoms mobility or whatever <laughs> no adaptability it would be well the frequency would be corresponding to like the energy which would uh end up having an effect on the mass so like so like if matter is made up of a bunch of vortices linked together right and we know that the oscillate, like the rate at which it oscillates and, and spin flows or whatever, is co corresponds to the amount of energy contained in it. And as it takes on more energy, it'll begin to oscillate and, and spin flow faster. And the the faster it oscillates and spin flows, the heavier it will get because the more it will it will churn the uh, the medium that it's sitting in and be. Uh, and be affected by like the uh the downward bias so literally by adding energy to the vortices you cause them to take on more weight or you could even say more mass because perhaps yeah. the size would increase i don't i haven't really thought about the size part but cause them to take on more weight have you heard of rotational mass pizio <laughs> I don't think it applies in this situation, but <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, like our weight and mass, the same thing. Uh, uh, I mean, maybe. Oh, maybe the maybe Planck's constant. What's Planck, what? What are the units on Planck's constant again? Planck's give me, constant. give me one second. Are you gonna? Yeah, you can just look it up. What are the units on Planck constant? I linked this presentation. Neutron times, right? volt meter seconds. Energy <laughs> has units. Of, yeah, it has energies of in, units of energy multiplied by time. Yeah, so perhaps Planck's constant is just a variable that describes the relationship between like how much energy present in an atom causes it to take on how much mass. So it's the lowest amount of energy that can exist in one over over the course of one second over like you know zero 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 cubic centimeters type thing it's electron volt seconds yes you know, in quantum mechanics yep it's joule seconds in, cl in classical um but it's <clears throat> okay energy within time well yeah because as soon as you have time then then you introduce motion and it's like if the energy corresponds to a frequency and it's the lowest amount of energy that corresponds to a frequency that within respect of time then that would be within a certain amount of time which i guess if it's in seconds then it would be in seconds but within this space of time the uh the lowest amount of of motion that we would be able to see because if it's the lowest amount of energy and energy corresponds to frequency, it'd be the lowest frequency, right? So it'd be like the minimum amount of energy or motion we would need for this vortex to continue to keep its form, perhaps. Mm. I understood that last part. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I was listening to most of that, but that that seemed like the well, dude. I mean, if you ha if you use a vortex model, it it 
there okay there is some level of truth to mass energy equivalence because what we think of as mass is just structured charges arranged in a giant vortex ring network governed by the electric impulse of density the grade caused by whatever the gradation layer of each yeah, whatever I'm, I'm cool with that density yes, gradient the medium the, there's charges within the medium and then they take on structured form and then the structured form creates bigger structures and they link and then between the four fundamental forces they retain they retain their form and take on weight quote unquote but um like what we think of as mass is simply if everything's made of ether you get this vortexual motion in the ether which is causing the ether to be churned up and take on like shape those faster i would say that the more energy it goes into it the faster it vibrates and oscillates and the faster it vibrates and oscillates the more ether it churns up and the more it turns up the the, the more mass it takes on into its structure because it's the greater amount the more the more ether, the more the ether that's churned up the more ether it takes on into its structure right more ether is more mass so the the whole churning of the ether based on the vibratory and also like the vibratory oscillatory and the uh like spin flow uh, frequencies of the vortex is what corresponds to like how much uh energy slash mass it has and the two are conjoined because what it because i mean you have to answer the question what is mass right what's matter i think matter is actually energy structured energy Which is what condensed light. <laughs> well, I mean, they like. I don't think mass is fundamental, right? I don't think matter. I don't think matter is fundamental. I think energy is fundamental. I think matter is only the manifestation of yeah. energy after after it's able to take structured, like the charges are able to take structured form. Yep, that makes sense. A direct result, nothing that like comes out of, comes out of nothing. It literally is forced to do by heaviest pressure mediation, and then it creates yeah, matter. I'm cool with that. What else? Yeah, but but matter matter is not anything in and of itself. It literally is charge that has Good taken sense. on structure. Yeah. Whereas in their paradigm, like matter is like a fundamental thing. Yeah, yeah. But you can also translate it into energy whenever you want, all the time, forever, and it's no takes you back seas and no problems. Yeah, they say the two are equivalent. It's like, <laughs> I don't think that they are equivalent, but they are linked. They are linked. Yeah, if they said it was linked, we wouldn't disagree so vehemently. He said that motherfucker said they're equivalent, and his equation made us all uh, seek into retardation. So, like, yeah, you, they said you could set them equal to each other. Look, it turns out nothing matters. You might as well just worship the devil, sacrifice your kids to ball, and come down to the fucking owl statue and get your robe. You know, let's do it. But then. That creates, I think the bigger question is, right, what is energy? Yeah, no fucking idea. Good luck. Because <laughs> like, mm. we can represent, we can define. You know what is not? <laughs> the potential to do work. Well, we, could, <laughs> <laughs> we could define, we could define matter in terms of energy, but then we have to define energy, and it's like, what's energy? It's yeah, I like, can't. Well, I can't do that one. Like, I don't know. That's where my brain just goes. Well, well, I mean, energy is like motion, right? What? Like, but energy, energy is like is, motion. It's proportional to motion, right? Like, if we energy have, is to motion as it, okay. it's just a live action role play, guys. Too. If we have a vortex. Like a little atomic vortex. You know where you should just keep saying? Vortextual. It's great. You can have that. We have a little atomic <laughs> vortex, right? And its energy is proportional to the, you know, oscillation and ro and rotation. Vortextual right? energy. That means the more the more motion it's doing, the higher the frequency of its oscillatory vortexual motion. motion. And then yeah. The higher the freak <laughs> the higher the frequency of its vortexual motion, the more energy it has. So that means the energy is proportional to motion. Man, how fucking stoned are you, bro? So baked. Yeah. So baked. I'm listening now and almost participating, but I couldn't dude, tell you what dude, I just I said. I you laughing, like, constantly. Dude, dude, is Alan still here? Yeah, I'm listening, dog. Dude, I mean, do you, do you see, like, the no. relationship between... Hold on. Hold on a second, Shane. Do you... 
do you see the the like what the relate like there would be a relationship between the amount of motion within the vortex and the energy that it carries? Sure. Yeah. The the momentum, right? Or I mean, it would have to be. Y- yeah. Because, Yo, Jesus, because, Shane, relax with the with the AI music, buddy. <laughs> You're killing me. Because the um. Like as its frequency increases and its oscillation, then vortexual motion increases. Like it's carrying more energy, turning more ether, gaining more size, so to speak. Um, which I guess you would say is matter. But either either way, it, that would that would create a proportionality. So when you say what is energy, like do we ever see do we ever see energy that's not represented as motion, right? Because if we don't, then you could say energy is motion. Static energy. Or energy causes motion. Yeah, but what... Okay, static electricity. Like, what is that? No, no, like, literally like, static energy. Like, non-motion, not in motion still energy. Is that a thing? It sounds retarded well, as I say it. Well, I mean, there's static electricity, but it's... The static electricity itself is is not... They would call it non-moving charges. Okay, but what's the charge? If you look at the charge really close, wouldn't you see that the charge itself is like the elementary unit E, which is like some some amount of because you could use Planck's constant and all these different stuff to to derive like the like the frequency or wavelength or whatever of it like there mm-hmm. would be there would be no a, it only a, applies to electromagnetic propagation Planck's constant wouldn't apply to electricity okay but the fundamental unit charge e right like you have a charge that's perfectly at rest how much momentum does it have? Well, it doesn't have any because it's not moving. Okay, but what's its what's its energy? How do you measure its energy then? Like we we define its energy as a constant. They they do this whole uh, isn't it a de Broglie wavelength or whatever where it's like an electron at rest or whatever? How much energy momentum it would have? Is there something like what? Not sure. They they do the rest mass. That's what it is. Rest mass. Um, which, what even is that? What? what? Well, you're resting the in, in, in an like resting frame. bitch face, but like mass and energy <laughs> not potential yet, or yes, <laughs> got, got my static energy resting face on. Hold on, it I'm should be the same as your inertial mass. Because that was the <clears throat> that was the whole thing with Einstein making relativistic mass uh, covariant with uh, inertial mass. There we go. Okay. The term rest mass refers to the mass of an object when it is measured from a reference frame where the object is at rest, meaning it's not moving relative to the observer. For particles such as electrons, which are never truly at rest due to their intrinsic thermal motion or even at, even at absolute zero temperature, the concept of rest mass still applies theoretically. So the rest mass of an electron represents its inherent mass energy as described by Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared, right? Even when elect- even even when an electron is in motion, it still possesses rest mass, which contributes to its total energy. What? So that's what I'm saying. Like even if you took an electron and put it at absolute zero temperature, they say like like the, it, the electrons are never truly at rest. The charge is never at rest truly. What would happen? So that's, that's that's what I'm saying. Because if it was to actually go to true rest, that it wouldn't would be have the, any energy. That would be the, yeah. The, if there, if it was to go to the true rest, true zero yeah. motion, absolute zero motion, absolute rest, that would be like reverting back into the inertial plane of everything is seeking that equilibrium at all times. There wouldn't be any energy. It would be it would be zero. It would be equilibrium. So like inner energy is. I mean, dude, energy is motion. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes can't sense. Of, I can't stuff. think. I can't think of any instance where energy would not be related to motion. You know what I like about that? You didn't say the potential to do work, and I'm on board with that. I mean, can you think of any instance where energy would not be relative to any type of, to some type of motion? It's the potential to do work or whatever. No, that sounds good. <laughs> I, I'm in agreement. I'm following your logic. Static energy exists. Nowhere. Sounds retarded. It makes me hurt a little bit. My mouth is feeling weird. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually kind of okay, glad you guys so are talking it, about this and you're not dice flow. 
So, energy. Nice. Energy's moving. The shout out to your boy. Uh, what, what is moving? Energy is. Yeah, exactly. That, that that was my next question. It was like, so where does it come from? <laughs> right. Where, where well, does the Where be, does the movement come from? It'd be the, the motion, flow from the okay. sky. So the electricity is raining. Like, just imagine rain turning into slush, right? So, like, the rain is the ether or, like, the electricity raining down from the sky, okay? And then all the matter that's down here is essentially a culmination of that rain. So, like, the slush, you know, like, before it turns into ice or whatever, is essentially solidified electricity that's been flowing down anyway. Uh, short form ether. I mean, like, what's moving? Yeah, yeah ether. it's ether. But, but, like, ether is electricity, and electricity takes form once uh like i guess it just kind of breaks down into like different shapes and that's what they call atoms and then the efficiency of that atom is basically what can, what constitutes the drag of the ether as it flows through the through the through the slush you know basically so it accumulates that's why you get like um that that's why you get crystals on like the the battery terminals on your car you know it, it's it's electricity can f turn into solid matter I would say that I would say that electricity is actual or or charge you could call it charge charge is actual like finite amounts of ether that are in physical motion pieces of ether like if you have you know quote unquote an electron right uh it would be like you know uh, it's, it's an induction line of like a, or or if in this model or in this conceptualization, like a moving piece of ether. Um, and it probably has a very particular type of motion, but regardless, there's movement. Uh, yeah, there's nothing still. And there's also not possible. And there's the ability also to convert, as we know, based on like the quantum stuff we saw earlier. There's the ability to convert between light and electricity, right? Like electrons and photons in their model. Because um, the photon would be, instead of like a piece of ether that's moving around physically, it would be like the, the overall ether medium at rest itself. It's not at rest, it's drifting, but just think of it as if it's at rest. A, a wave moving through that so a perturbation of the medium as a, as a whole itself whereas charge is actual pieces pieces of the medium themselves that are moving independently flowing so to speak 